Welcome to another episode where we discuss the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! We last left off at the end of 2007, where the Perfect Circle Monarchs build was by far the most competitively successful during this time. Their fall has always been a rather interesting one, mainly because it wasn't because of the typical banless hits that most meta decks receive that makes them no longer competitively viable due to key cards becoming forbidden. In fact, this deck only got further boosted with the release of new cards further in 2008 such as Caius the Shadow Monarch, which was essentially a better Zaborg in almost every way. So what exactly caused their fall? The answer can be said in two simple words that I haven't really mentioned too much in this series. Power creep. And what causes power creep? Oh boy, if you have no idea, you're in for quite a new chapter of Yu-Gi-Oh! Let's check it out. Let's skip over to February of 2008, as the first month of the year didn't really provide any format changes since the last video. February 13th, 2008 was quite the day in Yu-Gi-Oh, as that was the day that Phantom Darkness was released in the TCG. So what is Phantom Darkness? Well, ever heard of Dark Greffer, Samsara Lotus, Armageddonite, Super Polymerization, Allure of Darkness, and Ash Blossom? Well, you can ignore Ash Blossom for now, but the first five all made their debut in this set. While Samsara Lotus and Super Poly wouldn't be useful until years later in Yu-Gi-Oh!, the others on this list definitely significantly buffed the Dark attribute tremendously. You see, on top of these useful Dark support cards, the set also introduced Dark counterparts to previous popular boss monsters such as Dark Horus, the Dark Creator, and Dark Nephthys. All were pretty good in some ways, but the one that blew away all the others was Dark Arm Dragon. Originally meant to be balanced out by the rather difficult summoning condition, Dark Arm Dragon was way ahead of its time when players found out ways to manipulate the number of dark monsters in the graveyard rather easily. Essentially, the card requires exactly three dark monsters in the graveyard, not less, not more. Three. However, when it hits the field, it essentially provides the player the opportunity to destroy any three cards on the field, since each time you banish a dark monster, you can destroy any one card on the field. And we haven't even gotten to the best part yet. This effect was not once per turn. However, remember that the meta during this time revolved around OTKs, and despite the power of Dark Arm Dragon, it alone was not able to OTK. And so because of this, Players utilize Dark Arm Dragon alongside a combination of Destiny Hero Dark Monsters to create the infamous Return Dad deck. Dad meaning Dark Arm Dragon, of course, because he was everyone's daddy. Here's the basic strategy. Draw a bunch of cards by using Allure of Darkness, Destiny Hero Disc Commander, and Destiny Draw while also setting up the graveyard with Dark Monsters using Armageddonite, Dark Graffer, or Foolish Burial. With all this draw power, you're bound to get your Dark Arm Dragon considering it wasn't limited during this time. After that, summon Dark Arm Dragon and start controlling the field with its effect while banishing a bunch of dark monsters. Maintaining field control would typically force your opponent to play more defensively, which would give you just a few more turns to draw the last card you needed if you hadn't drawn it already. Return from a different dimension. This would allow you to special summon all those monsters you banish with Dark Arm Dragon's effect as well as Allure of Darkness, and then attack with everyone, and that's the OTK. It's that simple. It was actually pretty easy to pull it off. This was essentially the deck that would dominate the format because other decks such as Perfect Circle Monarchs and even Six Samurai were pretty good, but not quite enough. Yes, you heard me right. Six Samurai was starting to get some momentum during this time, but to be honest, this isn't the infamous Six Samurai deck that everyone knows about that would eventually get Gateway of the Six forbidden. That's for later. I'll also mention that for Perfect Circle Monarchs, yes, Ryza got limited and Light and Darkness Dragon got semi-limited, but everything else was pretty much left untouched. This is ultimately the reason why many people believe that it wasn't really the banless hits that guided this deck to their doom, but it was more so the introduction of other cards that simply power creep the deck's strategy. Going back to Return Dad, the deck was the best from February up until mid-May, when another booster set was released. And if you all thought Phantom Darkness was insane, wait till you hear about this next one. So the very iconic Light of Destruction saw the release of numerous cards that would completely change the meta for years to come. Let me start by asking you something. 
What do each of the following have in common? Amazon S, Venom, Dark Scorpion, and Alien. If you guessed that they're all archetypes, well, yes, you'd be correct, they are. But there's a second answer to it, too. If you guessed they're all amazing meta-relevant archetypes, then you'd be so right, fully wrong. As cool as some of these are, they all suck ass. That's just the truth. Before I make the next point, I will say that 2008 definitely wasn't the introduction of quote, good archetypes. There were some pretty good ones already, such as Dark World and Six Samurai, and certain components of other archetypes such as Destiny Heroes were also competitive, but Light of Destruction saw the release of the TCG's first two fully competitive archetypes, Gladiator Beasts and Light Swarms. We'll start with Gladiator Beasts. Gladiator Beasts were introduced to the TCG in November 2007, and while not awful, they also weren't that great. They had a unique concept that involved cards going back into the deck and essentially tagging out with other cards to trigger their good effects. But even with this, there wasn't a fantastic card that was able to really mess the opponent up single-handedly. Light of Destruction changed all this by introducing a key card that would go on to make the Gladiator Beast archetype extremely powerful. Gladiator Beast Gazarus. This monster allowed the player to target up to any two cards on the field, meaning either one or two, either your opponent's side or your side, either monsters or back row, either face up or face down, either attack position or defense position, any two cards. Let me just emphasize that. While it may not seem overly impressive in the modern day, keep in mind that this flexibility for field destruction was incredibly rare during this time, and this is also why Dark Arm Dragon was so amazing as well. They both have the same card flexibility for destruction, and made them both really really good. Next up is Lightsworns. Lightsworns are essentially a series of light monsters, as their archetype name suggests, who focus primarily on stealth milling. The archetype was great during this time for two primary reasons. For one, the idea of stealth milling is directly related to deck thinning. Every Yu-Gi-Oh player knows that a deck with 40 cards is inherently better than a deck with 50, for example. And also, the more draw and search cards a player uses, the better the odds of drawing what they need in future turns because their deck has been thinned out. Lightsworns capitalized on this concept. Men could easily filter out cards turn by turn while also filling up the graveyard with good monsters that could utilize it. Now this graveyard thing will be more prominent in later iterations of Lightsworn decks, but just keep this in the back of your mind for now. The second reason why they were great had to do with one specific card in their archetype, Judgment Dragon. When you look at it, it's hard to believe that a card of this caliber came out in 2008. But then again, you can make the same argument for Dark Arm Dragon and Gazarus. Judgment Dragon was a monster with 3000 attack, and a very simple summoning condition of having only 4 different named Light Swarms in the graveyard, and very importantly, it does not banish them as a cause for special summoning it. So that's only its summoning effect, but it gets better. By paying only 1000 life points, you could destroy all other cards on the field, Yes, that includes both monsters and back row, while also keeping this massive 3000 beater on the field. And get this, it's not once per turn. This specifically is of huge significance because any cards that have floating effects through field destruction would essentially be useless against Judgment Dragon as the player could just activate its effect again to destroy all the newly special summon cards. Many boss monsters released nowadays simply have the hard once per turn effect on the card description. Judgment Dragon bypassed this, and to be honest, it seemed accidental and really good for Light Swords. So, how did the competitive scene look at this point? Well, not surprisingly, these three decks were the top three meta decks of this period, with Gladiator Beast and Return Dad sharing the top of the meta, with Light Swords coming up right behind him as a formidable contender. However, an emergency ban list was released in May 2008, which banned Dimension Fusion, Limited Return from the Different Dimension, and Semi Limited Allure of Darkness. It's easy to guess which of these three decks this ban list targeted. With this, the results were easy to guess. Between May and August, Gladiator Beast won the next six Shonen Jump Championships, with Lightsworns and a nerf return that usually making it to the top percentages, but not quite enough to deal with the unnerfed Gazarus. This all began to change in early fall, however, with the release of the brand new summoning mechanic, Synchro Summoning. Although originally introduced in August to the 5D starter deck, Synchro Summoning wouldn't truly change the format until early September with the release of the Duelist Genesis. Essentially, Synchro Summoning introduced both Synchro Monsters as well as Tuners, 
both of which were very revolutionary, but in addition to this, Synchro Summoning introduced the first of many Master Rules in Yu-Gi-Oh!'s history. Master Rules are basically major rule changes to the entire game that completely alter once known rules. The first Master Rule, also known as the creative name Master Rule 1, made some significant changes to the rules being that the Fusion deck would officially be changed to the Extra deck. Also, the main deck must have anywhere from 40 to 60 cards, while the extra deck and side deck can have anywhere from 0 to 15 cards each. Previously, there was no limit on the main deck, and this change was mostly made to stop those players that would enter with a 3000 plus card deck. Yes, that's a whole deck that was actually used to enter in a tournament back in the day. Can you imagine activating like Rhoda to search for a specific card in this deck, and then proceeding to shuffle your 3000 cards? Holy crap. Anyway, the extra deck used to not have a limit cap, but now it did because so many generic synchros would mean literally every player could just put three of every synchro in existence in their extra deck if this wasn't implemented. So to be honest, this was actually a really great developmental decision. And the side deck used to require exactly 15 cards in it. If you didn't have 15, you couldn't play a side deck. But this was removed because... I don't know actually. Probably just because they realized that this rule was stupid and made no sense, and so they just removed it. Not that anyone would ever run less than 15 cards in their side deck, but at least the option was there now. Let's go back to the Duelist Genesis. So what notable synchros came out in this set? Well, the two big ones were Stardust Dragon and Goyo Guardian, but the 5D starter deck was also notable for having Colossal Fighter. Stardust Dragon was a fantastic destruction negate card, while Goyo Guardian was an amazing generic 6 due to its high attack and ability to special summon monsters to your side of the field from your opponent's graveyard. I know the card on the screen says Earth Required, but that artwork is post errata. It was a generic synchro beforehand, trust me on this. Colossal Fighter, by the way, had a really great revival effect where you could just keep reviving itself to keep coming back into the field. All three of these singles were pretty much thrown on every single deck because they were just great generic synchros. But among other things, the Duelist Genesis also introduced Krebons, Mind Master, and Emergency Teleport, three amazing support cards for the newly released Psychic type. And also, it did release Charge of the Light Brigade for Light Swords, a fantastic searcher. It's important to keep all of this in mind while 2008 comes to a close, as by the end of this year the infamous Teledad deck rose to prominence. The Teledad deck utilized Dark Arm Dragon, who was now semi-limited by the way, in combination with Krebons and Emergency Teleport to bust out quick synchro plays with Krebons while also sending these dark monsters to the graveyard to capitalize on Dark Arm Dragon. Another variation of this deck was titled Zombie Synchro, which utilized these cards but also capitalized on the newly released Plague Spreader Zombie from Crossroads of Chaos as well as the relatively new Goblin Zombie and Mizuki for general zombie support. And it also helped that many zombies were dark attribute and could also capitalize on card of safe return, which still wasn't limited at this time. By the end of the year, the dominating force slowly shifted away from Gladiator Beast and onto Teledad and its variant Zombie Synchro, as the two most useful tuners during this time were indeed Krebons and Plague Spreader Zombie. And right up behind them were a couple others such as Dark Resonator. This dominance continued until around March of 2009 with the new ban list, which limited Dark Arm Dragon, Emergency Teleport, Gladiator Beast Bestiari, which was used to make Azaras, Goyo Guardian, Plague Spreader Zombie, Mizuki, and Card of Safe Return. With this, it's easy to see that Konami wanted Synchros to sell more and for them to be the hottest thing in Yu-Gi-Oh! And yeah, they got their wish. It became clear that Synchro Summoning was not only the hottest new mechanic, but also one of the most efficient after this ban list. From April 2009 onwards, there were three main decks that were the powerhouses. The first was Synchro Cat, a deck that focused on abusing the newly released Dark Strike Fighter. The OTK revolved around only needing one specific monster, Summoner Monk, in the hand, as well as any two spell cards in the hand. Summoning one Summoner Monk and using it to effect a discarded spell card would bring out another Summoner Monk from the deck. This new Summoner Monk would pitch another spell card from the hand to bring out Rescue Cat, which would then tribute itself for two X Saber Airbellums, another great tuner monster. Each Airbellum would combine with the Summoner Monk to make a Dark Strike Fighter, thus you could make two of them, attack with both for 5200 damage, and then tribute them both in main base 2 for 2800 damage using their effect. And it was literally that simple. 
As a heads up, the effects of Rescue Cat and Dark Strike fight that you see on screen are their eroded versions, with many more limitations now than before. Their pre-eroded versions though were completely busted. The second prominent deck was Black Wings. Black Wings were a newly released archetype that was super consistent due to their spamming ability, powerful archetype synchros, and the power of Black Whirlwind, which could search for Black Wings each time a Black Wing was normal summoned. Almost every single Black Wing could special summon itself if another was on the field, and this led to super easy synchros and potential OTKs. The third deck was Twilight Lightswords which is also the specific deck that I'm easily most well known for in all my Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds Let's Plays on my channel. Seriously, if you want to see this deck in action, watch those series of mine because it's truly a beauty of a deck. But to sum it up, the deck would essentially capitalize on using Light Sworn for the light counterpart and cards like Plague Spreader Zombie, Necro Gardena, and Krebons for the dark counterparts, while also using the recently unbanned Chaos Sorcerer as one of its boss monsters alongside Judgment Dragon. For the next few months, the combination of these three decks would be the majority of the tournament winners, but September shut most of their tactics down. The September ban list placed Blackwing, Guild of Whirlwind, and Rescue Cat on the limited list, while Dark Strike Fighter and Card of Safe Return both got forbidden. Mizuki did come back to semi-limited, however, and this actually helped the Zombie Synchro deck enough to occasionally see some top spots in the last few months. But overall, Twilight Lightsworns were dominating for the rest of the year because the hits on them was minimal compared to the others, and it was also pretty funny that regular Lightsworns and regular Twilight Synchro decks were also rising in use, and all these variations of these decks were at the top of the meta. I know it's kind of a mess here with the meta, but just know that the meta at the end of 2009 was mostly light and dark monsters, with mostly a combination of Lightsworns, Psychics, Blackwings, and Zombies that use great tuners to also make great Synchros. And that's where 2009 basically ends. The increased popularity of Synchros only meant that 2010 would surely introduce more broken ones. Stay tuned for the next episode as we cover the next two years of Yu-Gi-Oh's history.